Chris Combs is an artist based in Washington, D.C. and Mount Rainier, Rail <coughs> Maryland. His talk covers the steps necessa necessary to convert a cool blinky into sellable art. Learn what art buyers expect, how to find shows, and more. Please welcome to the Hackaday Supercon stage, Chris Combs. Yes. Okay, so, is it on now? Let's switch one. Yeah, cool. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Chris Combs. I'm an artist. Am I sounding okay? Cool, great. Um, so I've got about 25 minutes of content, about 20 minutes in which I'm supposed to deliver it. So we're going to go kind of fast today. Uh, but I'm here today to tell you all how you can take something cool. I don't know about you all, but I have like a hall of completed things in my house. And sometimes I wonder if maybe those things should be in someone else's house instead. So the, one of the mechanisms for that is the world of art. I'm here today to give you kind of the protocol stuff that you need to talk that language. Um, so here's my bio. I am a full-time artist. I did that just before the pandemic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I just want to show you some cool glowing things. I'm not going to go into too much detail about these projects. They're all on my website. So if my slides are dull, go to chriscombs.net and see some video. Uh, but this piece was sort of a mainframe vibe. This is nine individual machines that talk to each other over radio. This was an outdoor thing that was outside for three months. One of the controller boards was eaten by ants. <laughs> and this is a whole lot of seven segment displays. Uh, so, you know, this is my joke. <laughs> Think of an area of life that has jargon, an ever changing landscape of external dependencies, exclusionary attitudes towards noobs, and lots of technical skills required for success. That's right, art. <laughs> so, I think like everyone in this room is making stuff, and you're all hacking it at technology, right? So, you can totally hack art too. It's just a matter of speaking a slightly different language. So I'm here to give you that compatibility layer. Uh, I also just want to say too, I'm not going to talk about like the big art world, like free ports, super yachts, multi-million, not, that's not, no. We're just doing the fun stuff. Small art, capital, like lowercase a art world. Uh, so I'm going to you know, start off with like, you've got something cool, like it's like glowing. How do you make it art? What makes it art? Uh, if you say it's art, it's art. Uh, But no, like seriously, like what do you have to do physically to make something? What are the tactical changes you make to make something art? So I'm going to get into kind of the, nit the like, uh, nuts and bolts of that, the nitty gritty. The first thing that people will expect from a piece of art is that it works. Like, sorry. Like you got to plug it in and something will happen. Now it could be okay if it takes like a minute or two for something to happen. You got to tell people that. But like you should be able to plug something in and have it like immediately do the cool thing. If you have to do like one power button or something, I guess that's okay, but try to avoid even like a power button if you can. Just like plug it in and it works. People love that. The other thing about like art is that it should be easy to like display, right? Like physically. So maybe you have something that sits on a table. The term of art for that is that it is a pedestal piece of art. It would be on a pedestal as we all wish we were. Uh, but also like if it goes on a wall, like someone might ask you, is your piece wired? And that doesn't mean like does it have a power supply. It means does it have like a horizontal taut wire so that you can hang it on a hook in your house. Uh, and there are standards for wiring a piece. Uh, let me talk a little bit deeper about that stuff. So here are the actual ways that you hang things. Uh, first off, resist the impulse. I, I did this a lot. Don't use the eye hooks because you're pulling on the same axis like the threads. You're fighting the threads. They will fall off your wall. Don't do that. So instead, you get these D-rings. They've got them at like all the home stores, you know. They come in a two-hole version and one-hole version, like the number of screws that it takes. You can get away with the one-hole ones if your piece is like less than, you know, like three kilos or ten pounds or something. But get the two ones if it's heavy. Um, and uh, when you actually are wiring it, like when you're putting the wire in, there's sort of like a technique for it. I just recommend looking up a video. I could not explain it to you quickly enough. Uh, so the other like main kind of way that I hang things is keyhole slots. You've seen these on consumer devices, like. You know, lots of consumer technology has this. You can do it too. So you can get these little metal plates that just like screw into a piece. Those are awesome. They're pretty inexpensive. I like those. But I also just love to integrate those cutouts into my 3D printed stuff. So you can just make yourself a little negative version of it, slot it in, print it, boom, love that. One caveat with these. I have had people buy art from me, and then they say, oh, I've got plaster walls. What do I do? 
And it turns out plaster walls, like if you put a screw into it, sometimes you crack the whole wall. So nails are a way around this. Some people will want to use nails instead of screws. So with these, you can do, you can get away with it if you use really large head nails, but just be ready for someone to ask you about that. And then also some venues will have hanging systems. Just if this comes up, ask lots of questions about how to work with it uh, because they're kind of weird and like each one's a little bit different. And also like normal humans do not have these in their houses. This is an art gallery thing. So ask questions if this comes up. Uh, and uh, don't do any of this stuff. I'm sorry, they all fail. Sawtooth hangers, clip frames, and 3M command strips. I love them all in their own way. Don't use them. <laughs> Trust me on that. Uh, people also, when they buy a piece of art, expect it to, I'm so sorry, no software updates. <laughs> like, you got to be ready. That thing should be production. So, like, in general, like, people don't want you to go over to their house to install an update. It will come up. I have done it. But just try to avoid it. Also, people don't want to have to configure the network for their art. Like, I know, I, I would totally be fine with that, but many people are not. If you do have some kind of network connectivity that you cannot avoid, um, just make it very user configurable, like have a captive portal. But something will happen when we get beyond Wi-Fi. I don't know what, so be ready for that. Also, people will say, can I get that with a white cord? Because it turns out, these walls are lovely. Most walls are dark, or sorry, are not dark. Most walls are light colored. And so people will just ask you, like, can I get that with a light cord? Now, I love the aesthetic of wires everywhere. <laughs> I bet we all maybe do too. But like, people are expecting that your power supply going to the piece comes in like a light colored version. And so the way that I get around this is with just standard connectors. Use DC five and a half, so those are great, because you can get an extension cord in white or black and just give people whatever color they need for the piece. You can also use USB-C for this. I personally am not amazing at fine pitch soldering, so I really like these sort of silly six-pin USB-C connectors. They only have power in the CC pins. There's an eagle footprint on my GitHub for them. Um, but you can also get these f lovely little adapter boards here that let you just you know, hand solder exactly the connections you need if you do need data. Um, because USB-C, like, it's easy to get cables in whatever color you need. I also recommend that you have easily replaced power supplies for things like common voltage, common amperage, and common connector. And now, next level, keep a spreadsheet. <laughs> like, you wanna know five years from now when someone's like, oh, the thing died. Like, you should be able to order them a replacement, ideally on some sort of like bookseller website that arrives quickly to them. And you should know what it is. I recommend keeping a spreadsheet. Uh, people like it when you sign art tube. I don't, you know, this is a thing. Uh, that's the back of that seven segment piece that we saw earlier and saw my business cards, which by the way, you're all welcome to have one come up afterwards. Uh, so this is the back of that piece and I sign my pieces on the back. You can sign your art on the front. You don't have to really sign it either, but some people will want it. And I recommend using Posca paint pens. It's just like a brand of paint pen. They're opaque, they go on any like surface, metal, plastic, doesn't matter. They come in black, silver, white, all sorts of fun colors too. Uh, just sign it with your name and a year. Um, and then stable materials. So people, when they buy art, don't want it to turn into goo by itself over the years. Weird, right? Uh, so, you know, no duct tape, no electrical tape. I also would personally recommend avoiding cheap DuPont jumpers because sometimes I've found that they just like build up a little more resistance over time. I don't fully grok why because I don't do chemist, but I would avoid those if you can. Upgrade slightly to fake JST. And if the actual like substance of your piece can scratch easily, just keep in mind like when it's on a wall, it will accumulate dust. People will want to dust it. So if it gets scratched when that happens, ew, bad news for you. So try to use something to protect whatever surface you're using. I really like for wood this substance called Butcher's Bowling Alley Wax, or I guess it has a new name now as of a couple of years ago. It looks like that. It's awesome. One coat, buff off, two coat, makes it shiny. I really like just wax to protect wood, but there are a lot of different options depending on what you're using. Just make sure your surface is fairly well protected. People also like having instructions. So just do yourself a little Google Doc, you know, just like a one pager. How to hang it in on the wall, how to plug it in, what do, they, what do they do if it freezes, how do you remove dust from it, and how are you reachable in the future. Just very simple stuff, print it out, put it on that dead tree stuff people use, pa paper. And then uh, people also expect that art is reliable, that it functions, 
So I'm going to talk a little more about like kind of the electronic side of things, how to do that. But let me just tell you some horror stories. People will put your artwork on timers. People will turn off the breakers to the whole gallery every night. Be ready for that. So some of the uh, particular things that I like to do to bring your gnarly blink john to the next level of reliability. Uh, when you're designing like your circuitry, I really like to focus on hardening your power supply. Now, caveat, I'm not an electrical engineer. I bet all of you are. Uh, so like, these are some techniques that I use. There are a lot of different techniques that people use. I'm just gonna give you a couple things that you can think about. Uh, I had one artwork that last winter, every time I touched it, it would restart. Turns out I had not properly protected the power rails. It did not have a varistor on there. So, you know, my little bit of static was like causing it to, you know, peak and then brown out. So throw a varistor across your power rails, uh, an MOV. So this is just like a lovely little thing, you know, if it gets above whatever in my case, like 26 volts, just dumps it to ground. Love it. Um, TVS diodes are also a nice way of protecting signal lines. I like this part. It's three by three millimeters. It protects four signal lines at USB two speeds, the fast speed, whatever that is, full high, huh? USB. Uh, I also recommend using some kind of resettable fuse, like a PTC or something, just because like, again, with the horror stories, tin whiskers, we just had Halloween. Like, I don't know, does this scare you as much as it scares me? Uh, imagine like some kind of short internal to your product. You don't want to start a fire. That's kind of bad for art to do. Um, I also, like, sometimes there'll be some weird latch up condition or something, you know, if someone's power is all over the place, I think having a PTC on there is nice, just as a basic level of sort of CYA. I also recommend reverse polarity protection. There have been a bunch of Packaday articles about it over the years. Uh, another horror story, center negative positive power supplies. Oh, they exist, someone will try it, and you don't want smoke. So I just, you know, throw a fed or two on there, whatever. Okay, file systems. If your device has a file system, try to make it read-only. I really like, as a Raspberry Pi person, like the Raspi config overlay FS option is great. You choose one menu option, your project is read-only. Uh, and it's reversible. I really recommend that if you're using Raspbian. It's very easy, it's nice. And if you do have to have a read-write file system, just try to minimize how much you're actually writing, you know? Like, turn off your logging once it hits production. Uh, make sure that you're just not spitting stuff out on the file system. And I recommend testing what happens when the file system fills up. Just use DD to a temp file and just fill the file system and see if your application falls over. If so, figure out why and fix it. I also recommend using things like log rotate, which is like a, a built-in Linux goodness that cleans out ver log. Uh, also clean out any like temp files that you create. You might be creating temp files without knowing it. Some libraries will create stuff in slash temp. So if you make a cron job that just looks in temp for old stuff and nukes it, that's just one extra little layer of like making things super polished. If your application randomly resets for cosmic ray reasons or any other, you don't really want your artwork to freeze. Like people might be crawling under their couch to find the power supply for that, you know? So I recommend using some kind of wrapper script to restart any of application code. Um, you can also use supervisor D, which I learned about from the Adafruit video, loop, video looper, just like an extremely robust video looper. Uh, Supervisor D is nice. You can also, within your application, I do a lot of stuff with I2C or I2C, don't know how you say it. Uh, if I see a lot of I2C failures in my application, I try to reset the bus from the application. It turns out if you use I2C detect to scan a bus, sometimes that resets a hung device. So if there's any sort of like bus or device that you use a lot in your application, you can monitor its failures and attempt to proactively fix problems. I recommend that highly. Um, also, if you're doing something outside, there's gonna be like extra layers of stuff happening. I, in one case, like that piece we saw with Blue Lanterns earlier in the Prezzo, I had a, a hardware watchdog that was off board from all of the other stuff with an, a separate power supply, just communicating over very simple, you know, opto-isolated like GPIOs. Consider doing stuff like that if you really need it. Also, if it has a network connection, break it and then leave it running for weeks and see what happens because something will break, I promise you, sorry. Uh, in Arduino land, you know, there's that timer overflow after 50 days. A lot of logic isn't written to accommodate it, so you might notice something weird at 50 days. Uh, and with Raspberry Pis, you know, if you don't have a network connection, just keep an eye on what happens if the clock should rewind on restart. Uh, so, okay, so we talked kind of how you make like a piece of art work like a given art buyer would want. But before we get to that point, you also need to get the art somewhere where buyers can see it. So let's talk a little bit about how you would work with potential venues. 
Um, so the things that they are going to want, this is like the protocol stuff. Like a given artwork needs to have, and don't worry about writing this stuff down, we've talked about each of these. It needs a title, it needs a list of mediums, not media, date, dimensions, photographs, not video, price, edition size if applicable, a bio, and this is the scary one, an artist statement. <laughs> uh. Titles. I recommend titling your artwork. I love Untitled Document 1 for Notepad. I don't use Untitled 1 for an artwork. Uh, if you need a title, just be literal. It's LED Ball Number 1. That's a great title. What I do recommend is that it is unique to you. Because someone might email you about this thing five years from now, and you're like, wait, what, what, what? what was that one again? If it's the same title as something else, that's confusing. Just try to keep, like, not a GUID, but a UID for you. A medium list. This is just like a comma delimited list of the visible materials in a piece. And I gotta say, they don't want part numbers. <laughs> they want like electronics, <laughs> circuitry, aluminum. Uh, and I'm really bad at keeping it short. It's kind of fun to sprinkle surprising things in there. Like I have one piece that ends in pie tin. Uh, okay, artist statement. You've all seen bad art talk. I am here today, I have an art degree. I am here today to release you all from being bound to write bad art language. You do not have to write bad art language. I think that when you're writing an artist statement, you should imagine that this is like what you would say to someone over a frosty adult beverage if you were standing next to them looking at your art. It should just be like directly like why you made this thing, why you care about it, and why you hope they care about it. So there are some extra things you can add on. You can be like, okay, how it connects to larger concepts in the world, like the gig economy or cryptocurrencies. Uh, you can talk about how materials have meaning to you. Like I use a bunch of barn wood that my father gives me from his place in upstate New York. That's cool, people like hearing the story. Uh, you can also talk about things that inspire you, whether it's like historical stuff or other artists. You can put all that stuff in if you want, but you really don't have to. All you have to do is say why you made something. So this is a, a really bad example. This is mostly real. I copied it off of someone's website and modified a few words just because I don't want you to pick on them. They're not the only person doing this. So many people do this. I cannot bring myself to read this to you. It's real. This is a synthetic example because of course I am the god of writing art talk. So this is just something that I wrote as an example of what you can do to be very clear. You know, I use vintage LEDs and found objects to recreate my childhood memories of riding a cherished carousel. Oh, that's so cute. Oh. So you can really just be very clear. Like you don't have to get crazy with the isms and stuff. That's not required, I promise. Okay, price. People are gonna ask you what you're gonna charge. So one really important thing to know, oh yeah, and you can't just say NFS, not for sale, but I'm here today to help you get things out of your house, so you should. <laughs> Name a price. Venues will want to take some of this price. So the price on the wall, let's say it's $2,000. A venue might take 30% of that, or they might take 50% of that. And this is a protocol thing. Art people do not like it when the price of an artwork changes between venues. It's just a thing, you don't do that. It gets weird. So what I recommend is just taking a price that in your head that you would be happy with separating, like you would genuinely be happy if someone paid you this money for this art and then add 40%, because that's sort of an average of what the cuts will be. So I recommend you do that, and then just stick with that one price for the lifetime of an artwork. Keep it in a spreadsheet, and don't change it. Edition size, this is more art language, protocol. If you're making one of something, it's easy. It's a unique object. Boom, done, people love that. I sell mostly unique objects, it's awesome. But if you're making more than one, because you don't wanna, I mean, you got five, you know, three boards from Osh Park, or five from GLC, like, <laughs> You might as well, right? Uh, so <laughs> decide how big your edition is gonna be. And what that means is like how many you're going to make. So like I can, you know, like I rec recommend like small editions, like you can do of four for JLC, uh, or like of 10 or 15, and that's great. Like that's totally cool. Just decide in advance how many it's gonna be because then each of the pieces you'll write on it. Like this is number three of 10. That's the way you work this out is you decide in advance how many you're ever going to make you don't actually have to make all of them right away, as long as you've got the parts and the means. So like, you know, I'll make the first couple in an edition, and then if they sell, I'll make more. You can do that, that's cool. You can also just be like wishy-washy and say like, oh, I don't know, open edition, that's the term of art. Ha <laughs> uh, ha, th that doesn't necessarily go over all that well with everyone, so I would recommend picking an edition size if you at all can. 
Okay, bio, what do you do for a bio? Ugh, more writing about yourself, oh, feelings. Ugh. Uh, just write your story, like who you are, where you are, what do you like to make? A sentence about each of these things is great. And then, you know, maybe list like an achievement if you got one, cool, the art people will dig, that's cool, you don't have to. And you can put in a fun fact about yourself if you want, but again, you don't have to. Yeah, that's true, Ada Lovelace loved betting on horses and she did run a gambling syndicate. Uh, photographs, okay, so the art world, or at least the process of like getting into art places, does revolve around photos to this day. It's not videos, you need photos. And they gotta be like super clean and just about your art. So the main things to like uh, pay attention to, I would say, are making sure the background is just totally blank, like nothing else in there at all, nothing. And the chords are pretty tidy, like you know, maybe even like tack them down, like go the extra mile, uh, because this is how they'll decide whether you get in or not. And uh, also like even lighting, no deep shadows, and then a couple of angles you'll wanna do. You'll wanna do a straight one, three quarters angle, and then some close up details. I'll show you some bad examples of my own and then some somewhat better examples of my own in just a sec. This is a bad photo. This is a piece that I love. It is so hard to capture. It's shiny, it's aluminum, it has an LED bar, it has a camera in it. Like all this stuff is hard to capture, so I phoned it in with this one. It's a mess, look at how much stuff there is in the background. It's kind of dark, you can't really see stuff. Mia culpa. So here's how I improved it a little bit. It's still not perfect. This is better, it's cleaner. The shadows are still a little bit too deep, but you can see that there's like not a whole lot else going on. Ideally, I would have even gotten rid of the label on the wall, that was lazy. The details are lit okay, but again, the shadows are too deep. So could be better, one of these days. This also, like this is a studio wall shot. I literally, this is like on my wall, I took a picture of it. This is what, you know, like you're making something, you're focused on your thing, you know exactly which parts to look at. Someone else looks at this and they're like, what, which one is it, what, where the wire, uh, uh. So improving on it, clean, just the piece, nothing else, literally nothing else, white wire, somewhat restrained in this case. Uh, you know, it's still not totally perfect, but you can see the difference there and how much easier it is for you to judge the artwork when it's in isolation with nothing else. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about what venues will want from you. Let's go a little bit bigger and talk about what are venues? Where do you put stuff? How do you sell? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about types of venue and I'm going to caveat this heavily by saying that I have USA-centric experience here and I do not know how other country do. But uh, these are a couple kind of like broad categories that you might wanna know. Museums do not necessarily, like these are not open to randos. They own stuff, they show their stuff, they don't really sell stuff. So you can pretty much write off things that say museum. There are caveats, don't at me. Uh, <laughs> commercial galleries too, only really kind of work with their people. Like they sign people up, they've got like deep contracts with their people. Maybe you can get that, but it's not like a starter outer thing. I don't have this. So these two categories, like you can pretty much write these off. But if you find a nonprofit gallery, to me that's the sweet spot because these places, they sometimes are called like art centers or institutes for art or like things like that. You can generally find out if a place is nonprofit or not on its about page. I think they're like legally required to tell you here in the US. But I think that nonprofit art venues are the sweet spot because they show a lot of kinds of art. They're open to stuff. They'll try things out. They have a lot of group shows with open calls for members of the public to apply to. And they also will sort of try to sell your stuff. They don't have like salespeople, so it's not gonna be amazing sales work. You'll still wanna promote your own stuff. Um, you can also do like totally, you know, off the map, like any coffee shop or hotel. If you're like, your walls are boring, would you like something glowing there instead? That's a thing you can do. It's just that they won't necessarily know how to do it. So you might need to like have a little bit of experience under your belt, knowing how to put things on the wall and like sell things. Um, and they won't necessarily insure your stuff either, so that's, mm. but it can be really cool and fruitful. Maybe not like a first step, I'd start with the nonprofits, but those, you know, they're, they're out there. Uh, and so like build a list of venues, I would say like use your search engines or whatever. Also go to the art store, ask the person behind the counter because they are an artist and they know, <laughs> I promise. So build your list of venues and then you're going to sort of watch each of those venues for opportunities as they come up. Uh, these are the kind of the main mechanisms. I would say like calls are the most fruitful. Uh, we'll talk about each of these for uh, in turn. So when a given venue wants to find artists for something, they'll put out a call. And this is an actual call um, for the Vector Festival, which is coming up. I encourage you all to apply. It sounds awesome. Um, but each of these like venues, will, they'll specify a theme. They'll say like, we want this particular topic. Here are the dates, here are the deadlines. These things are put out uh, in like a bunch of different in a bunch of different like communications media. Oh, and I should say too, there are different kinds of calls. 
if you see a group show called, that does not mean that it's for groups of artists. Like you don't have to be a group to apply to a group show. That just means that they will end up with a group of random artists all smashed together at the end of it. Uh, there's also solo shows where you as an artist get to put a whole bunch of your own stuff up. That's really cool. Oh my God, ego. But uh, don't start there. That's kind of a lot. Um, and then sometimes you'll find an open hang. I actually uh, have had a really good time with these. Like some art centers will just say like, okay, we're going to divvy up the wall into a bunch of squares and we'll sell you a square for $20, totally uncurated. I did this at the DC Art Center. There's this called Wall Mountables, and like someone bought a piece and was like, oh, by the way, I also curate a space. Do you want to do a show? So, you know, open hangs can be really cool. Maybe, I mean, I got extremely lucky, but like if you see one, it's worth, you know, showing up for. So the way that they actually put these calls out is like, not great. There's email, newsletters, uh, their own websites, because like you're going to check that. Instagram, uh, Facebook, or Twitter, I don't know. Like, I don't like any of these methods. I think they're all terrible ways of discovering calls. So what I do instead is try to automate the process as much as I can. I love RSS. If you don't know what it is, go look at Feedly. Feedly is awesome. It lets you monitor websites that have these feeds. Any WordPress site has them automatically. So many arts organizations don't even know that they have an RSS feed, but they do. And <laughs> It goes off every time they publish a new page, which is often for new calls. So I recommend that highly. Get Feedly, try it out. It's free to start out. And then if they don't have RSS feeds, no problem. Use a service called Visual Ping. This service is like free to a point. If you're doing a weekly check, it lets you monitor like 25 websites or something. So what you do is you point it at the opportunities page on these like venues websites, and it will email you whenever it changes. I like that. You can also get a private RSS feed, even better. And if you do like uh, really like a venue, I recommend, I'm so sorry, if reading their dumb newsletters. <laughs> like sign up for their emails and then you can pre-digest it a little bit with a filter. Just filter for like call or like opportunities or entries. And I recommend going through all those like once a week or something and just read them even if the subject line is totally off the wall because often these arts organizations are going to cram like 10 things in one newsletter. The subject line has nothing to do with what you want, which is opportunity for cool technology art, and that'll be all the way at the bottom. So just skim the whole thing, drink a bunch of like, you know, caffeinated beverages. And the other thing, I don't know about you all, but I really like working on projects. I don't really like doing paperwork or whatever the kids are going to call paperwork next. Uh, I think that I really get in the mood of like making things and when I, my RSS thing goes off, I don't want to stop and apply right then. But here's the thing, you don't really have to. All you need to do is save up all of the opportunities and apply to them before their deadlines. So I use a task tracker. I like Trello because I'm abstract random, but you can use your like iOS tasks or whatever you like, whatever task tracker you want. The one thing I would add is that you should set the due dates a few days early because you should be able to ask questions of the venue. Like some places, honest to God, in this year do not have electrical outlets. So you want to like figure out whatever you need for your piece, make sure they have it. But as long as you save these things up and do them as a batch, like I feel like that's more efficient for me. I can apply to like three things at once in kind of the same like state of mind. I like doing that. I also recommend hanging on to all the important parts from each call that you apply to, like the due date and the topic uh, and the contact information because sometimes you use Google Forms or something and that goes away after the deadline. So you want to know what you applied to and with what and what responsibilities you have signed yourself up for. So when the email comes back, you're like, oh, uh, sorry, I had that piece already. Mm. I recommend keeping all that in your own files. Also, like some of the entry platforms like Cafe, Submittable, Entry Thingy, don't write them down. It's a waste of time. There's like so much stuff on there. There's thousands of different opportunities on there and they're not really filterable or like all that searchable. But in your regions, look around, like do some Googling or ducking Figure out, like, is there some regional art publication that focuses on calls in my area? Because in my area, the DC area, uh, there's actually like a Virginia Art League group that puts out this weekly amazing post of like all of the calls that they know about. And they know about a lot of stuff that doesn't hit the usual channels. So just check in your area. Maybe there's something cool and regional. I do like looking at things that are close to me too, just so that like, well, if something goes wrong, I can go fix it more easily. And shipping work is a little bit of a thing, so I wouldn't necessarily start out with shipping. It's possible, but I wouldn't necessarily like dive into that. And also networking, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I guess we're all networking here. Uh, but like, if you go to an opening or an artist talk or something else at a given venue, 
they will sometimes promote other opportunities before they actually start spieling at you. Um, and you can also just see what they're like. I recommend that. And if you see a show that seems like it's annual and you like it, put it on your calendar for next year as a little present to yourself, like, you know, or your task tracker. Uh, just, you know, that stuff will keep coming up. They tend to program their calendars a year at a time, so that can be nice. And if an arts website doesn't explicitly tell you how you can apply to a show there, dude, They've got people who are paid not really enough to answer questions. Send them an email and just ask like a sentence, like how can I show at your venue? And the answer might be that you can't, but maybe it's something else. And what I really recommend is just attaching a cool looking JPEG to that email. You know, you don't have to give them all the details or anything. Just throw a cool image on there and they'll be like, oh, well, actually. <laughs> and I just wanna say too, like I am a professional full-time artist and I get into at most like 15% of the things that I apply for. Don't let that get you down. All of our successes will be built on a mountain of rejection letters. So just keep climbing. You can do this, I believe, in every one of you. That's me. Feel free to come up, grab a business card. <laughs> <laughs>